Good morning. On behalf of our partners at Our Daily Planet, the University of Michigan, and New Deal leaders, thank you for joining us. I'm Josh Freed, the Senior Vice President of the Climate Energy Program at Third Way. In the last 20 years, the United States has suffered a series of shocks. First, the 9-11 terrorist attacks and the aftermath of that event. Then, there was the Great Recession of 2008. Now, we are dealing with multiple shocks of COVID-19, the economic fallout from the global pandemic, and demand for racial justice for Black Americans in the aftermath of the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, and far too many others. This is the final event of a series that was created to focus on how to shockproof the nation from the next great crisis we know is coming. That's climate change. But we couldn't do that without focusing on racial injustice and the worst economic setbacks since the Great Depression, because climate will exacerbate these crises as well. Just this week, the House of Representatives took many of these issues head on through two bold proposals. The first was by the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, which unveiled an ambitious plan to address, the climate, to address climate change, as well as economic and racial injustice. The second is the Moving Forward Act, which the House will pass this week and seeks to put Americans back to work and make our transportation systems cleaner and more equitable. This is only the beginning. It will take more ambitious ideas like these, as well as people voting in November to get our country back on the right track. The fate of the planet and the Republic will be decided on November 3rd, 2020. The big question is, what America do voters want to live in? And which leader and party do they trust to help us get there? We're excited to have a truly fantastic set of policymakers, advocates, and experts here today to discuss how are the immediate crises we are living through likely to impact voter perception, attitudes towards climate change, and the election. I will be back here later for a conversation with former Mayor Pete Buttigieg. But to kick off this event, I'll turn it over to Julia Piper, from Green Tech Media and the popular podcast, Political Climate. Now, Julia. Hey. Hello. Just wait to make sure everyone's here and my guest joins me. Hi, Nathaniel. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you doing this morning? Good, it's good to see you this morning. Excellent. Well, to our listeners here, again, I'm Julia Piper, and with me here is Nathaniel Smith, Founder and Chief Equity Officer at the Partnership for Southern Equity. Nathaniel, the Partnership for Southern Equity is a multi-issue organization. You're working to advance racial equity and shared prosperity in Atlanta and across the South. The issues that you include, that you focus on, include energy equity, and I wanted to start by explaining what exactly that is, in your view, and how that fits into the current broader discussion we're having today around racial injustice. Could you start us off there, please? Well, thank you, Julia, for starting with that question. Um, it is a question that I'm asked a, a great deal um, in reference to the work that the Partnership for Southern Equity advances around climate justice. Um, as an organization, we define energy equity as the fair distribution of the benefits and burdens from energy production and consumption. I mean, it's that simple. You know, how can we work to ensure that there is a fair distribution of not just the burden of energy production, but also the benefits of energy production? And, and unfortunately, if you connect that agenda with the, the history, really, of, of structural inequities in America, the, the deep, deep, unfortunate commitment to extreme extraction, um, and the exploitation of not only our planet, but also our most vulnerable. Um, the energy equity agenda is just as important, in my opinion, to the racial equity movement as it is the climate justice movement. I know that 
you talk a lot about a just transition as part of your work. Could you also explain what that is and how you're working on these issues? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, we're finally in this place where we are beginning to understand the effects of, of fossil fuels on our planet. Um, we're beginning to understand the importance of advancing towards a clean energy economy, an economy that is not dependent upon fossil fuel uh, production and consumption. With that, though, we also have to understand that we have a legacy um, in the history of the utilization of fossil fuels of, again, exploitation uh, of extreme extraction um, and of an economy that did not work for everyone. Um, we're beginning to transition now um, towards this clean energy economy, an economy that is, of course, cleaner and hopefully more of a regenerative economy than an extractive economy. With all of that being said, if we're not doing what we can to ensure that as we transition, that we don't leave Black communities and historically disinvested communities behind, if we don't work to ensure that all communities have a chance to not only participate and benefit from this transition, then the transition that we are advancing is only replacing one oppressive economic system with another. So just to put a finer point on that, I think a lot of people think greener, cleaner, better. You're saying if we don't get that transition right, then that new green economy could actually use the same oppressive systems of the past. Is that a concern? I mean, exactly. I mean, I tell my friends in the environmental community a lot that we will never get to true sustainability without justice being at the center of it. You know, I, I, I pose a question to my friends a lot. You know, can a uh, community or a nation be truly sustainable and resilient if it is not just? And we owe uh, many, many communities because of the unfortunate history of racial oppression to get it right this time as we transition into a, a clean energy economy. And without doing that, I do believe that we'll be replacing one oppressive and extractive economy with another. So what would be some examples of where leaders got it right? Do you have a couple of those in mind? Yeah, so, so you know, I, you know, there are many, many positive examples of, you know, great work being done on the ground to ensure that communities of color, and in particular Black communities, have a chance to participate and participate and benefit from the clean energy economy. One of one example, and I actually I'll give two examples coming out of Baltimore. I, I know that there are many unfortunate conversations that are being lifted up about Baltimore and the, and the challenges that it is facing um, as a community, but there are also great examples of incredible work being done around advancing energy equity. One is an example of a, a great organization called Groundswell, who is uh, working, they're working to advance a community solar agenda that is equitable in the nation. They're working with uh, actually a church um, called Empowerment Temple, a 10,000 member church in Baltimore, Maryland to uh, advance a community solar project, which is now primarily a rooftop solar project, but it is creating energy for the community and the church. It's also providing a learning opportunity for uh, the students that are part of their uh, school system. And even more so, it is beginning the process of, of teaching and showing communities of color how solar can actually work for them. Uh, there's another example being led by a former Baltimore uh, Raven star, Ray Lewis. Uh, his organization, Power 52, is working to train a new workforce around the clean energy economy by leverage, by creating three resilient hubs in public housing in Baltimore's target investment zone. Um, he's leveraging these resilient hubs as an opportunity to train the community. And, and last but certainly not least, we're working um, in Atlanta the partnership of Southern Equity with the Atlanta University Center, which is the largest conglomerate of historically Black colleges and universities, along with Groundswell and Georgia Tech, uh, to create an urban 
equity, energy equity resilience hub, where we are again working to create a microgrid that will provide not only PV capacity, but also storage capacity that will actually support the energy needs of low income communities surrounding the Atlanta University Center, as well as the Atlanta University Center complex. Interesting. I think that's really helpful to get some specifics around what this could really look like on the ground. Yes. To take the other side of the coin, though, what would be an example of where this has not gone well, where you think the communities have been left out of energy decision making that has been negative for them? Yes. And, you know, you know, Julia, I'm always the person that attempts to, to look at a problem as a glass half full as opposed to a glass half empty. But unfortunately, we do have a very uh, sad and uh, inequitable examples of what happens when um, a clean energy future does not include equity as a key component of it. One unfortunate example it has occurred in Georgia through uh, the expansion of our nuclear power plant, plant Vogel. Um, right now, um, it is over $3 billion um, over budget. Um, even with the recommendations of the Public Service Commission staff, uh, it continues um, regardless of the challenges that it has created, not only in terms of the cost for uh, the customers, but also the predominantly African-American community that surrounds Plant Vogel is a community called Shell Bluff, a community that has major, major problems as it relates to poverty and economic opportunity. They have not received the benefits that were promised to them as, as it pertains to the expansion of Plant Vogel. And also there were many, many challenges as it relates to the Public Service Commission actually listening to the community concerns. And they chose, unfortunately, to side with uh, the utility versus the voices of the community, even though they had been elected as the Public Service Commission. Um, so there are many, many unfortunate um, components to Plant Vogel, but I would definitely lift that up as an example of what not to do and, and, and what happens when energy equity is not a central component of our uh, sojourn towards a clean energy future. I know that other folks working on nuclear issues have brought that up as well and are looking at advanced nuclear solutions as a way to remedy some of those uh, missteps of the past. Uh, you mentioned, though, having a seat at the table and being part of decision making. What do you think is a way to get more uh, people of color at that table? I've spoken to, to folks in the past who just say they actually get edged out. They can't make it to, to public utility meetings, things like that. What is the way to make sure that those voices are heard in the decision making process? Well, first and foremost, I believe that the environmental community has to begin to look at Black communities and communities that have been historically disinvested in as a key component of the environmental movement. Uh, unfortunately, there is a history of marginalization uh, within the environmental movement as it pertains to not only the needs of communities of color, but the history as well as the assets and perspectives that these communities bring and could bring to the movement. So we have to do an attitude adjustment within the context of our environmental movement. You know, there are many times that I've been in the room and I've been the only person of color, in particular the only black male invited to that conversation. Uh, the environmental movement will not succeed without it being more inclusive and actually lifting up leaders that may not necessarily look like the traditional environmental leadership community. Um, second, you know, it is not enough to encourage communities of color and black communities to be at the table. We must do what we can to ensure that we educate them on where the challenges are and where the opportunities are for advocacy. The Partnership for Southern Equity, we do a place-based educational effort called More Money, More Power, where we're going into the community and actually educating and training them um, about the various challenges and opportunities associated with uh, the clean energy economy. Who are the individuals that are making policy decisions as it relates to their you know, uh, utility bill and, and all of these other key things that the community will need to know in order to be effective advocates for their communities as it relates to climate justice and energy equity. So we have to be very focused on our training and agency building work as it relates to the communities that have been marginalized. 
as well as look at them as a key component to the change that we seek as it relates to climate change and inequity. Um, and, and last but certainly not least, um, you know, it, it is very, very important um, for us to not only train um, and provide, you know, opportunities for agency as it relates to their engagement, as well as looking at them as valuable. We must be very uh, forthright, strategic, and committed um, to placing those communities um, in, in the front of our movement and, and look at them as leaders in our movement. And that, is, that only means that we put them in front as leaders, but we also work to ensure that the resources that many of our environmental organizations receive to do this work are also funneled into these organizations that are led by communities of color that are involved in the environmental movement. So we talked about the just transition and we've talked about that in terms of the new green economy, clean energy, and making sure that communities of color are brought into that and black communities in particular. I'm wondering how you think about the transition of formerly fossil fuel communities, communities that are transitioning out of fossil fuels. Some of those communities are in other parts of the country, maybe more rural, maybe whiter. Is that part of the same conversation in your mind or is that a different element of this? I mean, it has to be. I mean, it, it has to be a part of this movement. And, and, and on many occasions, the, the conversations and the, and the work around a just transition can be focused sometimes exclusively on communities of color. And, and there's a reason for that. I mean, communities of color have, been, have suffered a great deal as a result of energy decision making. At the same time, we have to be sensitive and, and have a broader understanding of, for example, you know, our friends in Appalachia or in coal country um, that unfortunately have to choose between their livelihood and their health. Um, that is a crime and, and no human being should have to make that choice the same way that in some communities in urban areas, mothers and fathers are being forced between paying their utility bill or buying groceries. Um, it all is a justice issue, and, and we all have to figure out a way to work to ensure that as we transition, that all communities benefit from it. I mean, one clear opportunity, and particularly in rural areas, is engagement around rural electric co-ops um, and, and how rural communities are receiving energy and how we can leverage rural electric co-ops through an energy democracy agenda to leverage those resources in a way that will create new clean energy opportunities for those individuals that are depending on fossil fuels for their livelihood to transition towards a clean energy economy. But we have to be more forthright and more committed to ensuring that we can come um, to, to ensuring that all communities understand the importance of the just of a just transition and that we actually use this conversation about a trust just transition as a bridge um, uh, not only from a racial perspective, but from a demographic perspective um, between various people who need to be a part of the same movement. Two last quick questions um, in our final remaining minutes here. One, I wanted to quickly touch on COVID-19. It has disproportionately hit Black communities and other communities of color, Indigenous communities. I'm wondering what you would like to see in response from leaders to help tackle that issue in your communities. And you can frame that through an immediate response or through the recovery and how you may see that playing out. Do you have some thoughts there? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the challenges around COVID-19 have really elevated uh, the historical challenges that Black people and communities of color have faced in America and how structural injustices have um, created the conditions for um, a weakened not only immune system for communities of color and, and black people, but also weakened communities. And so, you know, I juxtapose this conversation with also the advancement of uh, resilience, you know, the importance of a resilience uh, agenda as it relates to urban and rural communities. I mean, both of them cannot just focus on recovery. Um, recovering from COVID-19 or recovering from, um, uh, 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 you know, through a resilient strategy, 
we've got to begin to focus on not just surviving, but thriving. And, and I think that the, the issues and opportunities around COVID-19, as well as our work around resilience, or even the challenges that we face around the uprisings that we're experiencing, have to begin the process of thinking about what are the structural injustices that have brought us to this point? And whether it be around um, looking to see how being car dependent has created unhealthy communities where asthma rates are high for African Americans in urban areas, what does that then mean to solve that problem by creating more walkable communities or uh, utilizing public transportation policies um, as a way to advance equity? What does it mean to also begin the process if we know that in impoverished communities, the housing is not healthy? And that again connects to the challenges around COVID-19 or our resilience work. What does it mean to leverage the, the resources of our utilities as well as other donors to advance a healthy housing agenda where not only are we working to ensure that these houses are more energy efficient and healthy, but we're also leveraging this opportunity to do workforce development programs. So the people who live in those communities have a chance to learn how to do energy audits and, and weatherize homes as well as solar. So, I mean, I think that there's an opportunity, yes, to, to acknowledge, and I think COVID-19 and the uprisings have forced us to acknowledge a history of structural racism and white supremacy in America, but that should not be an end to our, 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 to the challenges that we're facing, we've got to begin to not only acknowledge, but also begin to leverage policies um, as a way to turn the page in order to undo some of the structural challenges that we're facing in our communities. And COVID-19, again, um, has uh, exposed that. And, and I think now is the time for us to begin to work together to solve many of the problems that we've turned away from because we felt they've been too complicated to solve. Hi there, can you hear me, Nathaniel? Yes. I've changed angles because my computer decided that this was an appropriate time to reboot. Uh, so apologies <laughs> okay. for that. It's okay. <laughs> technical difficulties in this quarantine age. Um, we only have one minute left. I just want to quickly get this in. What's going to get black voters out in 2020? I know we're running a little behind on schedule, so it'd be great to keep this short, but I think it's important to note. What do candidates have to keep in mind if they want the black community's vote in your mind? Well, I think, you know, in the immortal words of Aretha Franklin, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. I mean, I think that um, it's going to be important for anyone who wants the black vote to work to ensure that their policies reflect a level of respect that they have for those communities. It, you know, it's not just about advancing a guilt trip on Black people um, that they should vote for a certain candidate because, you know, they should or they're not committed to the Black community because they don't vote for a particular candidate. Black people are looking for real policies, real solution, and real solutions. They're not looking for uh, flowery talk, or you know, they they want to they want to see real policy. They want to see real um, uh, empathy from the candidates in terms of you know them through their policies. Again, not just their words. Uh, you know, through empathy. You know, through an empathy frame show to show that they really care and understand what they're going through and, and that has to be manifested you know in through through the public policy recommendations that are being made and then i also think that you know we, we have a very unique opportunity to finally um injure and maybe kill the 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 the, the, the most major pandemic that we've dealt with in our nation's history and that is structural racism. And I think that it's gonna be important for any candidate to be willing to fight and, and try to inoculate America finally from that virus. And, 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 and I think the black community will support emphatically anyone that is willing to, to, to try to inoculate us from this challenge and even more so translate their plans for inoculating our communities uh, through public policy and community engagement. 
Thank you so much, Nathaniel. I really appreciate it. I'm going to hand it over now to Monica Medina at Our Daily Planet for a conversation from leaders in four swing states. Good morning. Let's give everybody a chance to get um, to be live on video. All our panelists are now signing in. We're just making the transition. Thanks everybody for your patience. Great, now we have uh, Councilman Green. Just waiting on a couple more. Lisa, great. Thank you so much everyone for your patience and thank you panelists. I wanna welcome you while we have you joining um, the, the uh, event this morning. Thanks so much um, again for uh, participating this morning. This is the last in a series of panel discussions that Our Daily Planet has done with uh, Third Way. It's been really an interesting set of discussions. We've talked about the intersection of racial injustice, COVID-19, and the climate crisis and climate injustice. And we've seen in these previous panels how integrated these issues are and how hard it is to solve one without solving the others, which makes it particularly hard given how tough each of them is individually. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Another technical glitch. I hope you're all still there. I'm still here. Anyway, still here. so great. Councilman at large, uh, Derek Green from Philadelphia, and finally Lisa Wozniak from the Michigan League of Conservation Voters. And now I see Congresswoman Murphy. Okay, great. I think we have everyone and thank you all for your patience. Thank you panelists. Um, and thank you for uh, audience for your patience while we work through that technical glitch. So let's dive in. You are all from key swing states in this election and you represent every level of government and NGOs that are active in, on these issues today. So it's a perfect panel to talk about the policy and the politics and how they come together in this crucial election year. I wanna start with you, L Lieutenant Governor Barnes. You are your uh, governor's uh, leader of your climate change task force. You've been all over the state of Wisconsin listening to voters about climate change and in the midst of the pandemic, um, I wonder how you think Wisconsin voters are looking at these issues and how do they prioritize them when they think about um, the election and what's facing us? Yeah, so I'll say, I um, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, I do get to chair our governor's task force on climate change. And the thing about these meetings that we've been having is they aren't necessarily, they aren't you know, targeted at voters. We want to get public input as we work to develop the most comprehensive and inclusive and equitable policy in, address, in addressing the climate crisis that's in front of us. Uh, you know, people don't think of Wisconsin as a coastal state, why would you? Uh, but we are bordered by three bodies of fresh water and climate change impacts the state of Wisconsin. We have Lake Michigan to the east, Lake Superior to the north, and the Mississippi River to the west. Uh, so it's very important that we tackle and challenge these issues, but there's a lot of diversity uh, in Wisconsin, uh, and a lot of people don't think that either, uh, but there's a lot of um, geographical and topographical diversity uh, that means that climate change plays out differently in different parts of the state. Now, last year we had basically a never-ending rainy season, which delayed crops, which impacted rural economies, which impacted uh, uh, farming and food prices, which is a problem for everybody in, in the state of Wisconsin. The people are responding to this, not always uh, understanding that the culprit is climate change, but they know that something is different and something is wrong. If we're having these hundred year storms every other year or every year, uh, then they know that's a problem because uh, people's livelihoods are being impacted directly 
and they want leaders who are going to step up and answer the call. And there was just some polling data that was released that shows how important of an issue uh, clean and safe drinking water is. And it also, uh, you know, talks about climate resilience and how and how that should be a priority for anybody uh, who's running for any level of office because folks are dealing with this. And, and as we uh, go through the process of hosting these task force meetings, it's all been virtually lately, uh, of course. And we had our first two public uh, hearings. Uh, where the public was able to give input, but we did this in a way that facilitated discussion. We did break, virtual breakout rooms uh, where people were able to sort of talk amongst each other. And I, uh, you know, I bounced around from room to room just to sort of hear what people were talking about. But we documented all those things, and you know, it came down to uh, you know third party solar. It came down to again the clean and safe drinking water, which was paramount. That sh that was in every uh, conversation. Uh, water pollutants, water contaminants, the list goes on and on and on. But if you don't have a plan to address these issues and also chart a path forward and tie it to the economy, it's going to be very hard to uh, find success. So I think that voters are ready uh, to uh, engage and, you know, get fired up to get behind somebody with a climate plan. And we are working on a climate plan here in Wisconsin. That's great. That's great to hear. It's great that it's such a top of mind issue. We've worked so hard to elevate this issue and climate justice as an issue. So now to see it coming to the fore is great. Congresswoman Murphy, I'm going to turn to you now and ask you about your state. You're sort of in the, at the, at the peak of all the crises right now. You've got COVID um, peaking again in your state going up. Um, you also are in the midst of hurricane season and it's supposed to be a bad one and um, you've had uh, challenges with your election system as well. So tell us about voters in Florida and how they're balancing these issues and how they see it, particularly um, because it's expensive. And I know that you're a fiscal conservative yourself and so um, as a Democrat. So just tell us what you think about um, these issues and how your state is handling them and how you're going to balance the needs and the costs. Well, um, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here with everyone. Um, you're right. Our, our state is in the middle of a, a really bad storm um, from a healthcare perspective, the um, hurricane season and um, uh, the ability to um, deliver safe and secure elections in just about 120 some odd days. Um, and how have we been handling? I, I would say that the state hasn't been doing great. Um, you know, from the perspective of the pandemic, uh, I think that we have lacked leadership in Tallahassee and we've had to depend on our local mayors and um, the, the local electeds to, to make the right decisions as far as closing bars and, and enforcing social distancing and requiring wearing of masks, very simple things. Um, but those things haven't been coming out of Tallahassee. And so Tallahassee has failed on the, the healthcare front, but they're also failing on addressing the economic impact. We have over um, 2 million people who have filed for unemployment only a little over half of them have actually received any of their benefits. People are struggling in my state because they've lost jobs. Our economy in Florida is so heavily dependent on high contact industries, tourism, and, um, and their government in Tallahassee, which um, implements the unemployment system has failed them. They, they built a system that was intended never to deliver benefits. And now all of these, so it wasn't meant to deliver benefits in good times. And now that we are in a crisis, it's basically completely failed. Um, so on that front, not a, not a lot of, um, uh, you know, good, good governance there. Um, and, and you're right, I, I am a, somebody who believes in fiscal responsibility, but I think that when we're in the kind of crisis that we're in, we need to provide the financial assistance and the financial support for businesses and workers so that we can get through this. People are out of jobs through no fault of their own, not because they're unwilling to work, which is, seems to still be the perspective of my colleagues um, on the other side of the aisle. They're out of work because of this pandemic. And so how do we as um, electeds provide the necessary support. And yes, it's going to require spending. We, our only pathway out of this pandemic is 
uh, testing, tracing, and treatment um, and until we get to a vaccine. And so in Congress, we've been passing, uh, we've passed four bipartisan bills to provide that kind of support. I think we still need more, we need to do more. And um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that the Senate will come around to seeing that too, and we can provide additional support there. Um, as it relates to hurricane season, uh, we are seeing hurricane season creep up earlier and earlier. I actually asked NOAA to relook at whether or not um, the designation of starting hurricane season in June makes sense anymore, given the data that we have. That was set in the 1960s. Climate change has, has significantly changed the strength of hurricanes, and we're seeing more storms. We've already had three named storms, um, and we're just in July, right? So we, we need to see how we do that. My concern is that um, as our hospitals fill up, we're gonna have these um, mobile uh, medical units that are gonna be outside in Florida heat uh, with hurricanes bearing down on them. This, it, it, we have a real severe situation coming up here. And then on the election piece, I have really struggled to get um, the state to do the right thing to ensure that every Floridian has the right to a secure and safe um, election. First, before the pandemic, trying to get them to take seriously the foreign hacking into our elections. We know that um, the Russians were able to get into two, count, two counties um, in 2016. And um, you know what, what are we doing to make sure that that doesn't happen again? Um, and to, you know, it, it sows doubt in the minds of the voters. And then on top of that, the federal government provided additional resources to uh, states so that they could um, uh, execute on safe um, elections uh, in a COVID era. And it took the governor a long time to pull down that money. And um, when he finally did, he still hasn't told us how he's gonna use it. We're 120 days out from elections. So, it's a lot of challenges right now and a lack of leadership at the state level. So that means that we are relying more on our local electeds and um, we're trying to do what we can from a federal level. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Murphy. I agree with you on hurricane season. As a former leader of NOAA, it's been a little daunting to see those um, hurricanes come sooner and sooner. It's not just a fluke, I don't think. And I, I think you're right about that. Um, we write about that all the time in our Daily Planet, our daily newsletter, how, um, how much of a concern it is, how uh, much more extreme weather, how many more billion dollar weather events we're seeing. And I think um, the government does have to spend more in order to help us prepare and be ready. So um, Councilman Green, I want to turn to you now because um, as Congresswoman Murphy said, a lot of the burden is now falling on state and local officials, local um, uh, governments like your own and you in in Philly have um, definitely had you know your share of difficulties with the COVID crisis because of you know the uh, density of the population and um, you know how it spiked in uh, nearby New Jersey uh, tell us a little bit about how your constituents are handling this and particularly given the the um, the stretched budgets that you're going to be under now and going forward, given the pandemic and the economic um, crisis that we're in. How do you see those things um, being balanced, the need for better health care, for services in local areas where people are, you know, right there, where your constituents are right there? Um, and then how do you balance that with keeping up with important programs like Solarized Philly or weatherization programs, the kinds of things that Lieutenant Governor Barnes was talking about? Just wondering how you're balancing these crises and the demands. Well, Monica, thank you for the opportunity to be on this panel. It's great to really have this conversation at a federal, state, and local level. Uh, you mentioned uh, the financial challenges we're having in Philadelphia. Most cities around uh, this nation have had similar issues because we've had a loss of revenue due to COVID-19. Uh, we were just able to pass our budget and we had a $750 million deficit. And that's based on you know people that traditionally would work in the city of Philadelphia, but may live outside of the city uh, in Bucks County, Chester County, Delaware County, South Jersey, but are now working from home. So that's had a major impact on our budget and how we have to deliver those services. So we're trying to balance all these issues, but we've also had a concern in reference to 
how COVID-19 has really impacted our city, especially the African-American and Latino community. Uh, early on, you know, we were seeing the numbers on a daily basis and many of uh, the African-American community and Latino community work in frontline positions or essential positions. And so many did not have the option of working from home, but had to go to work in order to put food on the table. And so testing became a big issue um, in our city. And we were able to work with different organizations. Uh, for example, um, Dr. Ayla Stanford uh, and Reverend Marshall Mitchell, uh, in, in, who represents a church right outside of Philadelphia, put together what's called the Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium to provide testing for people in the city of Philadelphia and beyond. 96% of the people that they tested were African-American. Um, we've seen a huge impact in African-American community regarding COVID-19 and not only African-American community, but also Latino community. And so we really pushed to provide additional dollars for um, not only Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium, but other groups that could provide testing. And so in the early part of this pandemic, we did an $85 million transfer ordinance to try to really deal with some of these issues regarding COVID-19. And then we really pushed the administration uh, to provide money for this organization to make sure they could provide testing. And since we've been looking at all the numbers and what's been happening in Philadelphia, we've seen about 1,600 deaths in the city of Philadelphia. About 60% of those deaths are African-Americans and, and Latinos. About 71% of the hospitalizations are African-American and Latino people. And so when we talk about COVID-19 and the racial disparities, it's also connected to climate change because many people are having higher respiratory issues, which make them more susceptible to COVID-19, which is tied into climate change and the impact. So the COVID-19 has had a very significant financial impact in our city, not only from the revenue that we've not been able to bring into the city, closing our, a number of businesses because we've had a shelter in place, but also from a health perspective to the African-American and Latino community. So this has had a major impact uh, here in the city of Philadelphia. I serve on the board of the National League of Cities and I talk to colleagues all around the country. They're dealing with similar issues on the impact of COVID-19 um, to their budgets. Um, we've all gone into a new fiscal year, which started July 1. So it's had a major impact and I'm concerned about the following months because I'm not sure that we'll be able to recoup all that revenue. That's why it's so important that we press on um, DC. And I know um, Representative Murphy is doing the work that she can, but we need to make sure that we get legislation like the SMART Act, which will provide revenue reimbursement for cities like Philadelphia and cities all around the nation to receive the dollars that we need so we can move out of this crisis and also deal with the healthcare issues as well as the economic issues in our city so we can continue to fund great programs like Solarize Philly that you talked about, which enabled us to bring um, climate change issues to the African-American community and allow people to put solar panels on their home in areas of the city that traditionally have not been exposed to um, this information, this idea, and also provide opportunities for entrepreneurship for African-American um, as well as Latino individuals in the environmental community. So this is a real issue and a real concern, and it's gonna be a concern going forward for all of us uh, at cities like Philadelphia. Yes, I, I agree. We've heard that over and over again in the course of this series, how important it is for cities to get this kind of assistance. I know Congresswoman Murphy, you guys are working on it, but it's kind of amazing that it hasn't made it farther it hasn't made it up in the process of all the stimulus bills that have come through that cities haven't gotten as much relief as um, it seems like they need and they are on the front lines. So let me turn to you, Lisa. You've been so patient. Thanks for waiting. Um, you represent the NGO community in a state that is full of these same issues of you know, you've had, your, you've had to deal with COVID and um, surging cases there, although things seem better. You have had climate crises, you've had pollution crises um, that still aren't particularly all the way solved in Flint and Detroit and water. You've had dams bursting due to unusual rain events. 
and you have the auto industry kind of at a transition where you know we need to move to electric vehicles and you um, represent a, you know you're in the state that is sort of the the epicenter of our auto industry here in america so just wondering how you see the voters of michigan grappling with these issues and how do they prioritize climate vis-a-vis -vis covid vis-a-vis -vis their economy it's a great question. I first want to just thank, thank you, Monica, for inviting me to be part of this. And I'm, I'm certainly very honored to be on with these esteemed guests. I want to thank all of, all of you for your leadership. It's so incredibly important always, and especially at this time. Um, I want to start just by, I mean, I, we're all on this, on this uh, webinar because we represent four incredibly important states. And uh, to answer your question quickly, yes, this, this, this uh, Michiganders uh, care deeply about the issues we are talking about today. But let me start by saying that Michigan as a coin toss state, as a 50-50 state that people forget about all the time. I don't wanna go into the numbers by which this current president won in Michigan, but we know that it was pivotal. Um, that said, public opinion research that we do together with unions and other large progressive organizations across the state has consistently shown across 18 plus months um, uh, increased enthusiasm around these elections on both sides of the fence. We're seeing that some of the highest numbers we've ever seen of people saying they absolutely intend to vote in November. So that said, um, our issues are playing a particularly important role in all this right now. In fact, they're at the epicenter of, of all of the conversation. And notably, and this goes to what uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes mentioned, um, it, it's water. In Michigan, it's water, and it's notably safe water, free of contaminants. Um, and we've, we're seeing that in battleground state house districts, it is the number one issue in those, those house districts. And, and here's why. I'm going to give you a little perspective on this. And it's intimately linked to climate. Um, number one, uh, yes, we are the home of the Flint water crisis, and it is a crisis that has not yet been concluded. Uh, the people of Flint, the people of Detroit, other major cities in Michigan are dealing with very high levels of lead in their drinking water, um, notably in African-American communities. In Metro Detroit, for example, the children of Highland Park and Detroit public schools can't drink the water out of the drinking fountains in their school systems. If they, if they, if they get back to school this year, that's the case. Um, in addition, we have over 1.9 million Michiganders across the state that have some level of toxic PFAS uh, it's a chem family of chemicals that has been associated with firefighting foam, uh, nonstick products, carpeting, but that's in their water. And we've had water shutoff issues, notably in, again, predominantly African-American cities. Um, huge kudos to our governor and lieutenant governor to taking that issue on within COVID-19. But I mean, it has been and continues to be um, all about water. You add to this climate change, it's intersectional, it's intersectional, of course, but we're seeing the impacts of climate everywhere. Um, as Governor, Lieutenant Governor Barnes mentioned, we're seeing devastated farm fields from flooding. We're certainly seeing the dams that you mentioned earlier um, completely burst, drain a lake, devastate a community, um, huge financial damage, but the displacement of thousands of people during a global pandemic. Um, and we're seeing flooded basements um, again and again in Southeast Michigan, all linked to, to climate change. Um, and then we are, we are seeing through this picture that I've just painted for you, uh, why clean, safe water outperforms everything else in the polls that we're looking at. It outperforms the minimum wage. It outperforms the women's, women's right to choose. It outperforms even the economy gearing up more quickly within COVID. Um, and so, and it's all intimately connected to racial justice, equity, and climate justice in so many ways. So in Michigan in 2020, in this election cycle, our issues are at the forefront. They're at the epicenter of this conversation. They're central to the debate. And I'll finish by saying that in reference to Nathaniel Smith's earlier comments on this webinar, it is essential that we meet voters where they are. Very importantly, the black voters of this state and this nation with a great deal of respect and with real tangible plans to address the problems that we face. Yeah, it's, um, it was such a powerful thing he said about respect. And um, I think it's something that we're all 
realizing is so, so important. And you saw it in um, the climate action plan that the House Democrats put forward, environmental justice and issues of um, structural racism and pollution were bred, you know, were um, put throughout that bill were addressed throughout the bill um, or the plan. So I think um, we're just beginning to see that as a, as a really important issue. And I want to just um, note to our audience, we will be able to take a couple of questions. If you have one, um, you can pose it. I'll be able to see it in the Q&A box. Just click on that. In the meantime, I want to toss one to everybody while we um, wait. And that is about the election. Lisa, you talked about the importance of these issues and how they're elevated. How would you explain to candidates on the ballot? And I know um, Congresswoman Murphy, you're one of them. Um, how important these issues are um, to voters in your states, particularly when your states are the ones that are sort of on the edge, as you said, um, uh, Lisa, that are so important where every vote matters and getting out all the people that we can to vote who care about these issues. How do we motivate them? How important is it? And how do we explain to politicians who are running that this issue really is at the top of their list? Anybody, I, I, I toss it to the whole panel. I'm happy to just quick give you two quick thoughts on that. Um, yes. I, I, I often say that, you know, when um, Vice President Biden can actually travel to other to states, um, if he's not talking about safe, clean drinking water everywhere he goes, he's missing the mark. Um, the candidates running for office here have seen the polls. Um, they've seen that this is intimately connected to racial justice and equity. They've seen that it's intimately connected to climate. But the way to voters in Michigan is about is speaking about water and protecting our water and making sure it's safe, clean, and affordable to every every voter in the state. Yeah, I, I would like to piggyback on the justice comment because environmental justice is so wide ranging. And one thing about our task force, we want to make sure that we have representation from all corners of the state, from all walks of life. We have higher education, we have environmental advocates, we have members of the legislature, we have utilities on there. We have uh, environmental advocacy groups, uh, indigenous communities, the list goes on and on and on because we want everybody to be a part of that conversation. We want everybody uh, you know, driving the policy decisions that will come out of that task force. And when it comes to elections, uh, a candidate, whether it's Joe Biden running for president or James Smith running for village board, wherever, right? Like you have to take on these issues of environmental justice as they vary from place to place. Environmental justice could look much different in a rural community where a uh, tornado uh, came through and tore down a barn. And this is a real life story where we have, you know, farmers with tears in their eyes wondering if and how they'll rebuild because it just may not be possible at that time if you couple, you know, the dairy crisis on top of the weather. I mean, there's that, that's a, a completely different conversation. Uh, but environmental justice, as, uh, as Lisa mentioned, whether it's, uh, you know, the drinking water, uh, or excuse me, the drinking water issue with lead contaminants and nitrates and PFAS, uh, you know, people, people get it, people understand that something is wrong. And in this moment where so many Americans are standing up to demand justice, we can't let environmental justice be lost in that conversation. Yeah, and Monica, mm -hmm. just to follow up on that same point, I think really making sure that you tie the concept of environmental justice to how it impacts everyone's everyday quality of life you know, Lisa talked about water and you know, we passed a resolution supporting the work of Detroit City Council member uh, Scott Benson and all the advocacy he's doing uh, as part of Democratic municipal officials because of the issues of water in Michigan. Uh, here in Philadelphia, we're dealing with a former refinery that's being uh, repurposed. So I think making sure that no matter what group you're talking to, you're really explaining how environmental justice impacts them in their everyday life because sometimes just the phrase environmental justice can sound a little esoteric and people can't really grasp it. But when you break it down and really say, listen, you don't have access to clean drinking water, that's when you really make the connection. Or as what um, Lieutenant Governor Barnes said as well, making that connection at the local level, how this issue impacts their day-to-day -day life. And to Derek's point about um, impacts of uh, their daily life, every Floridian is uh, impacted. Uh, 
every single day by climate change, whether it's sunny day flooding or hurricanes that are stronger than uh, to the point where they can't even be categorized or, um, you know, drilling in our uh, Gulf, uh, um, you know, f just the, the, the list goes on. Florida, um, you know, the, the green algae that we saw, all of this affects our everyday life our quality of life in the state, but also our economy. We are heavily dependent on tourism. And there, when our beaches have sludge on them, nobody wants to be um, in the waters. And so it's so critically important to us, this whole climate crisis. And I think Floridians particularly can feel that. Um, and so I'm really proud that it was a Floridian, Kathy Castor, who led our select committee on the climate crisis in Congress. And this week she rolled out an incredibly ambitious plan that we're reviewing, but it starts an incredibly important conversation about what bills, what laws, what things we're gonna do today to try to address this issue um, because the truth of the matter is like young people are calling for it. I, I chair Future Forum and this is um, climate justice, you know, climate change. These types of things are front and center for young people, uh, young voters. And they, they, they're no longer accepting that we aren't gonna do something about it. Um, so we, she, she rolled out the plan, we're reviewing it now. I look forward to being able to take some action on the proposals that she put forward. And there are real tangible things to take steps in the right direction. In addition, we, um, we uh, are going to put in our infrastructure bill, um, the green energy um, tax incentives. I sit on the Ways and Means Committee. And so we have um, this whole package of clean energy, um, uh, green economy tax incentives and getting those things across the finish line so that you know you're incentivizing this behavior and making accelerating the innovation that is out there that can help us solve our climate crisis is critically important um, and so you know i think we are at a tipping point um, to see really big bold action um, because it's being called for by our constituents who are living the everyday consequences of climate change Yes, we do seem to be at a tipping point. And it does seem basic that if you can't wash your hands in a pandemic because you don't have clean water, we are in a bad place we need to fix. So let me pose one last question. We only have a couple minutes left. So I'll ask each of you to be quick, but I'm gonna um, go to, uh, I'm gonna combine two questions. They're pretty similar that we got from um, our audience. Um, in uh, the future, we will still have um, a bipartisan government, you know, we'll have a lot of Republicans and they have ideas about um, a, a tax on carbon and market-based systems. What do you all think of those solutions, particularly if we need to find bipartisan ones going forward? I'm, I'm consistently rated one of the most bipartisan members of Congress, um, as well as one of the most effective members of Congress. And I always share that fact because I think um, those two things go hand in hand. Being able to uh, be bipartisan has enabled me to be effective. And I think when it comes to climate change, you can have the biggest and boldest ideas out there, but if you can't get them to become law in a divided Congress, then they don't help the people that we're trying to serve. And so it's critically important that when we try to um, address this issue, we do it through um, you know, what is in the, the realm of the possible. And um, it, that means working in a bipartisan way. It's such a big um, issue that we need to make sure uh, that we advance ideas that can become law and that we need to be mindful of the economic impact on middle-class families and the working poor. So we can't help them by hurting them. So it's a delicate balance of being able to provide tax incentives, um, create uh, a pricing um, for uh, pollution and things like that without negatively affecting um, the most vulnerable communities um, in this process. Um, and I, I, I tend to think that once you have a bipartisan idea, one, something that you can get through a divided Congress, you've vetted out some of those issues and have taken in the perspectives of all the people who are going to be affected. And it tends to lead to better, um, uh, better outcomes and better laws with less unintended consequences. Thank you, Congresswoman. I'm gonna have to um, 
toss it over to Josh, but I do want to say that I know in Kathy Castor's uh, plan, there is a lot of discussion about the need to make sure that when you have these market-based systems, they don't un, um, unduly burden those very communities that are already unduly burdened by pollution. And um, I know, I apologize that I haven't given everyone a chance to answer that. Um, but I want to thank you all. This has been an incredibly rich discussion and it um, has been a great series with uh, third way. So on behalf of Our Daily Planet, a daily environmental newsletter, I want to thank you, Josh, for working with us on this, for giving us a chance to talk about these important issues, to have a chance to meet all these wonderful leaders across our country who are working on them. And thank you, panelists, very much for your comments this morning. And uh, I know we'll have many more chances to talk about these and hopefully um, a, a brighter future after November. Uh, Josh, to you now to talk with Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Thank you, Monica. Thank you to everyone who joined us in that excellent last panel to Our Daily Planet. Uh, we are thrilled to have former Democratic presidential candidate, Mayor of South Bend and New Deal leader, Pete Buttigieg with us for the next half hour. Mayor, thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon, great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. You know, today, our audience, not surprisingly, is an uh, organization based in Washington, D.C., is, is significantly from within the Beltway, and if it's not, it's mostly on the West Coast or in New York. Uh, especially since the pandemic, we haven't had a chance to travel or be in or part of red or swing states in America. And as a candidate, as the former mayor of South Bend, and as an Indiana, you have and, and live there. So I want to start with that. Uh, we have 125,000 dead, more than a million infected with COVID-19, the worst infection rate in the world, 21 million unemployed, and the, the list of challenges this country faces right now, racial justice protests, climate denial, and then the emerging news of potentially rushing bounties on the heads of American soldiers. And that's just the last six months. Yet, right. from the perspective of all of us, we look at the polls, uh, which obviously are not always predictable uh, or reliable, but you know Donald Trump is only 10 points down nationally and is competitive or tied in Florida, North Carolina, Arizona. He's leading in Indiana. And I think for, for those of us who don't live with supporters of Donald Trump or people who aren't committed to one party or another, the question is, how is this race still so close and why do people still stick with, uh, with the president under these circumstances? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm really uh, uh, thrilled to, to be here. And, uh, you know, New Deal was one of the most uh, uh, important uh, efforts that I participated in as mayor and, and to each of the co-sponsors here. I'm really glad we're, we're having this conversation because the view from on the ground here in Indiana is a little bit different than uh, the, the uh, headquarters of a lot of our uh, party and advocacy organizations and, and, and for that matter, a lot of our media organizations too. And it's worth remembering that in our system, uh, people get sorted into one of two camps, uh, even if they don't fully identify with either of them. And there's a lot of that that goes on uh, around here and in, in lots of parts of the country. I will say this, though, you know, if you'd asked me three or four months ago, uh, whether anyone in the base behind this president could be shaken out of it, uh, I would have thought, you know, if, if you've uh, stuck along for all of this, if you stayed with him through Gold Star Families and John McCain and Access Hollywood and, and Helsinki and Charlottesville, nothing could possibly come along that would ask you, that would motivate you to say this far, but no further. I was wrong. Uh, there is evidence that people, not everybody, but a non trivial number of people are ready to step away. And I think there are a couple of reasons for this. First of all, it's uh, glaring how inadequate this administration's response has been to meet the moment, and there's just no getting around it. And, uh, you know, right now, if you look beneath uh, the, the top layer of the numbers, we're seeing that the, the pandemic is expanding largely in more conservative states. 
And healthcare and public health is an example of one of those issues that uh, in the end, it's, it's uh, hard to fool people about what's happening in their own lives. To me, one of the most remarkable things to happen all year is that last night, we got the results from Oklahoma that by a ballot initiative, people in Oklahoma voted to amend their constitution so that even their own governor couldn't stop the expansion of Medicaid. And this is an example of the gap, I think, between voters in conservative areas, or even conservative voters, and a lot of politicians on the far right right now. Now, what we've got to do is make sure we cultivate and build on this moment, uh, because there are, just as a matter of basic human psychology, uh, ways to, to invite people uh, uh, over to your side, and there are ways to push them right back to where they were. And we have an opportunity right now uh, to ask people to think about what uh, a future could look like that's just different from how we got here. And, you know, in, in, in this moment, it's about a lot more than just pointing out to how dreadful the Trump administration has been, although that's, that's very real. It's inviting people to picture what a better future might look like, where we have better healthcare, where we have real uh, infrastructure, uh, where we have addressed the uh, most glaring issues of racial and, and economic inequality in this country. And uh, there is a big American majority for that uh, across people who have habitually voted one way or the other. And that's one of the reasons why for all the bleakness of our moment in some ways, I think this is also a time for a lot of optimism in others. Thanks, and, and, and um, I think your last point is so important, both in terms of providing optimism to people, but also the opportunity. And you know, an example of that, even in just the last two panels that we hosted prior to your joining us, and across all of the events we've done in the last three months, environmental justice, uh, exposure of racial inequalities and climate, safe water, and public health issues due to COVID-19 have finally broken through. Um, you know, they, they too often in the past were shunted aside or ignored. And um, the conversations being had, but what, what's, what's some examples of what policymakers can really do to address these issues? And is that, is that a key to addressing voters of color, particularly younger voters who are skeptical about whether their vote makes a difference? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, one of the messages for younger voters is the longer you're planning to be here, the more you have at stake in a bunch of decisions that are about to be made that can't be reversed that will affect the rest of your life. And nowhere is that clearer than around environmental issues. And I think sometimes uh, environmental issues were considered uh, kind of an elite concern in the past. But as we've seen through uh, concerns like uh, the poisoning of, of uh, children, mainly black children in Flint because of lead in drinking water, as we've seen uh, issues around the, the uh, outsized impact that climate-related extreme weather has had on communities of color and low-income communities. And we've seen that right here in South Bend, both of those issues actually right here in South Bend. Uh, what we're seeing is that environmental justice and racial justice are intimately connected. And there's also a question of justice between generations, generational justice, because when you have uh, figures in Washington saying, we don't want to take any of the steps needed to secure the future, what they're really saying is that we would rather punish a future generation for our own Ill inability to solve these problems. Uh, so we've got to get out of a false choice that uh, sets up a trade-off between uh, doing the right thing for the economy and doing the right thing for the environment, much as we had to defeat the false choice and still do between the idea that uh, either we surrender to the virus or we're destroying our economy. Uh, when actually, as Austin Goolsby put it, the first rule of virus economics is uh, you got to fix the virus in order to have better economics. It's the same thing with climate. And uh, so this is an opportunity, I think, for a younger generation to lead the way, as they really have uh, when it comes to climate, when it comes to racial justice, when it comes to gun safety, and demonstrate that there is already an American majority, even though these ideas can't seem to command a majority in today's Washington. And that's where, uh, first of all, we've got to be much more serious, I think, about de democratic reform, structural reform. Uh, to the, the conditions that keep a majority of the American people from being reflected in policy, uh, knowing that there are concrete policies right now uh, that, that we know would make a difference around carbon pricing, around uh, greater funding for uh, renewable energy research, energy distribution, storage, and capture of carbon. Um, but uh, also recognize that these changes really are going to be very swift uh, in, uh, in terms of our public opinion. Matter of fact, they're already there. One of my favorite metaphors furnished by American culture uh, is that of a coyote chasing roadrunner 
running off the cliff, but hasn't looked down yet. I think that's where we are in, in terms of a lot of uh, these uh, kind of old habits and, and resistance uh, to, to ideas that the, the moment has passed, they're off the cliff, uh, they just haven't looked down yet. Uh, on, on that note in particular, um, one of the things I found interesting in the response in the media and from Republicans with the unveiling of the House Select Committee uh, climate report and then the introduction and hopefully passage this week of the major transportation bill that the House considered is the perception that uh, from the media that the plans are unrealistic, that they may be too ambitious. And uh, the Washington Post even yesterday noted that there's concern that the plans will quote unquote hurt Democrats in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, Republicans are, you know, they're already criticizing it as we all knew they would is the Green New Deal too. How, to your point about the Roadrunner and Coyote, is this just sort of another lagging indicator where uh, the perception is just incorrect and these attacks can't work? And do, do we need to do anything else to make it clear that ambitious climate policy isn't a political liability? Well, I think it, a lot depends on how we talk about it. Uh, these are policies whose time has come that can command the support of the American majority and that are needed. But we need to make sure that we talk about them in a way that isn't dismissive of the, the very real fears that some people have who can't see where they fit in a greener future. Now, the reality is, as I look around, certainly South Bend, uh, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, I think when people picture green jobs, they imagine you have to be a specialist in photovoltaic cells. We're going to need union carpenters and electrical workers to help do building retrofits that we need so that we have more energy efficiency and less carbon emissions. We're going to need the very same manufacturing base that has built uh, petroleum-based, uh, fossil fuel-based uh, autos in, uh, across the last hundred years, especially in my part of the country, uh, to be there building the next generation of cleaner transportation as well as cleaner fuel sources. We got to make sure we're not dismissive when we talk about those who do wonder if they're going to be left behind. And they don't have to be. In fact, that's part of what good policy does. Uh, it finds ways to train and equip and harness uh, those who uh, have always contributed to our economy but need to do it on new terms. And yeah, I remember moment after moment on my presidential campaign, Shenandoah, uh, Western Iowa, very conservative, rural area. Uh, we were in a barn. It was packed. Uh, it was hot. And uh, there was someone maybe 20, uh, kind of looked like a prototypical farm kid raising his hand saying, you know, how is my community and, and, and my generation of people involved in agriculture can be part of the, the solution on climate? And there's a very real answer to that. Actually, we need agriculture to help lead the way. Some of the possibilities around soil management, uh, for example, uh, really change uh, what our carbon uh, capture future might look like. The original carbon capture technology is, you know, plants. And uh, we've got to make sure we weave that full picture. And sometimes because of where I think a lot of our uh, most influential uh, and dynamic thinkers and, 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 and talkers on uh, some of these policy issues sit, they don't always uh, instinctively uh, fold that rural perspective into the story we're telling, but we can and we should, because it's also rural America that stands among those with the most to lose if we fail to meet the moment when it comes to climate. And, um, one question around that you hit on the word green and, and that a lot of the people that will benefit, whether it's in agriculture or particularly uh, the traditional manufacturing and industrial unions, don't necessarily see themselves as part of uh, the transition to the green economy. How much of it is, a, is actually just a narrative and wording problem that, uh, as others have said, you know, green jobs and clean energy jobs now have just become jobs. And is, yeah. is there a different way we should be talking about it, particularly those of us in the climate and energy advocacy community? I think a lot of it's making sure that we demonstrate the blue collar potential of the jobs that are gonna be added. It's, it's not just uh, kind of trying to make up for jobs that may phase out, it's, it's celebrating the additional jobs. Millions, we estimated in the climate plan we put together and uh, that's very much harmonized with what's, uh, what's uh, coming out of the house right now. Uh, so yeah, so, and, and a lot of it's just making sure that uh, folks are included in the conversation too. Uh, and uh, they, they have a vocabulary already with them um, that when we fuse it up to these policy priorities can, can make a huge difference. Uh, look, th this is a do or die moment. I mean, up until now, I think these things have been talked about as abstract and theoretical and far off. But you look at the ticking clock that's set, not by Congress, but by science, and we basically have a decade to make these dramatic changes. Uh, the question of whether we can pull it off in time or not, whether it's too ambitious or not, um, 
is ultimately uh, a question that I think misses the, the fact that we, we just plain have to. And uh, I think also there's an opportunity to harness a kind of progressive patriotism around this. Uh, you know, a, a country like ours should not be daunted by the challenge in front of us. We should, we should be excited about it. Uh, we should be motivated by it. And I actually think it's exactly the kind of national project that can pull us together at a time when we need more projects that are felt as a common, urgent uh, thing we're all in on or part of in some way, yeah, in order for us to rebuild some of the social cohesion that this country needs. Yeah, um, it, it, that's an important point, particularly at the moment where we see the response to COVID-19 because the lack of leadership from the White House and the administration really devolved down in many cases to the state level, but even often sit in states like Florida, as we just heard from Representative Murphy, down to the very local level, that there, there is a, a lack of feeling of common purpose and cohesion. And, you know, of course, the media likes to focus on understandably the most sensational component of it, uh, as does Twitter and social media with the people who don't wear masks or who want to confront those who are requiring masks. How real do you think the division actually is versus the distorted vision that we get from staring too long at you know, our Twitter feed? Well, if there's one thing I learned on the campaign, it's that Twitter is not the real world. Uh, it's, maybe it's part of the real world, and it definitely drives coverage because uh, uh, reporters are, are disproportionately likely to be on Twitter. But uh, often there was a huge gulf between the social media-driven questions that I was asked by reporters and the questions I was asked by voters. And uh, that was ultimately reflected in, in a lot of the uh, results as well. Uh, that's not to say that, that these uh, conversations we're seeing play out that way don't matter. But uh, I think that, you know, if, if you look at where most Americans are, I mean, yeah, the, the, the crazy stuff is going to command the most attention. It always does. It's one of the issues we have with the president, too, right? A lot of people are saying, well, uh, you know, why, why, why isn't Joe Biden getting more attention? When the sitting president of the United States makes an ass of himself, that will always get more attention than anybody behaving respectably. It's just, it's just gonna happen. That's okay, because there's quality as well as quantity to the kind of attention that we wanna capture. And uh, especially because I think now, uh, another reason we're seeing some people uh, who, who, who had been with this president to date finally uh, drifting away from him, is it's just exhausting. Uh, uh, just as it's exhausting to be punched in the face by the, the, uh, the flare up of the moment on social media. So what we need to do, I think, is make sure that uh, we're, uh, we're never losing track of where the center of gravity of the American people is. And the good news is the, the center of gravity is shifting in a, a strongly progressive direction. Uh, but uh, that, that is something that uh, won't just happen on its own. The math will not save us. Demography is not destiny. We need to work to organize and to solve problems because you also get a lot of credit when you have a policy that actually works. Look at healthcare. You know, healthcare was the toxic, fatal liability to Democrats back in 2010, my first experience on the ballot. By 2018, it was the winning issue for Democrats. Why? Because the policy came out and people noticed that it helped them. And uh, sometimes that's simple. I think, again, that's part of what's driving the, uh, uh, the results in Oklahoma and Kansas. Uh, there was a rejection of an ideologically extreme experiment of slashing taxes and services uh, because it just didn't work. And while uh, you know, we got a lot of work to do in terms of narrative to connect the dots and to combat misinformation, uh, in the end, people are, I think, more savvy than they get credit for uh, when it comes to wanting to sustain and develop policies that are making their everyday lives better. When, when you talk about that, in, in the, I mean, it, this fits within the lagging indicator that, that Congress and the media is in general. And as you're on the campaign trail and as you interacted with your constituents in South Bend, uh, particularly around climate, were there actions, whether it was at the local level, or particularly things they thought the federal government could do that they talked about, that, that voters gravitated towards, that we just don't hear about whether it's on Twitter or from the media? Well, we, we built uh, here in South Bend a climate action plan with a view toward that future that we needed. And it, the issue became a lot more personal around here because we had uh, two once in a lifetime, once in a millennium floods. We had two of them, and they were two years apart. And we know there's more where that came from. And it's a reminder that you don't have to be on the coast to have to worry about these issues. From a policy standpoint, it, it always works best when people can see it, right? So uh, even something as simple as uh, popping a couple of city-funded uh, electric car charging ports uh, downtown just signaled that we were a, country, uh, a community that was moving in that direction. And 
I think in a very tactical sense, made people a little more open to getting one of those uh, vehicles that are not all, you know, it's great if you can afford a Tesla, but you know, Chas and I got a, a used Ford C-Max plug-in hybrid that's fantastic. And for the first 20 miles or so, which is as far as either one of us goes most days, uh, might as well be an electric car. And we, you bet we plug it in downtown when, when we're uh, close to that, uh, that free charger the city put in, and there's more where that came from, right? So it's those little things that do a little bit of signaling, but also involve the resident, the citizen, and the kind of practicality uh, of moving forward, as well as the big things, like having a community uh, conversation about what commitments we've got to make and what uh, short-term costs we should be prepared to bear in order to make sure that the way that this city is built, the way it develops, the way we pick up trash, the way we, uh, the way we move around uh, is, is going to be consistent with a future where we are carbon neutral by 2050, which is what we're gonna to have to do really in order to make it. So same thing nationally, if people can physically feel like they can touch uh, the, the, the consequences of these policy changes, uh, it gets a lot easier. Uh, and it, it gets a lot, uh, a lot of its kind of uh, uh, own momentum. Uh, when the windmills went from being some kind of newfangled exotic seeming thing to literally a part of our landscape and a source of jobs for people we know, that changed the way so many people in the heartland think about uh, renewable energy. And despite a president talking about them causing cancer, or knocking out birds or whatever it is, uh, the, the reality is, again, something you can physically see. So it's a lot harder to trick people about it. Yeah. And, and uh, the fact that they're making money off of it and they know that that's where their electricity is coming from certainly does not hurt at all. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, those, the, a lot of those are, are the, the false divides between Democrats and Republicans or between voters and, and action on climate. Um, in previous years, we, we did see a lot of real disagreement within the Democratic Party, whether it was around, should nuclear be part of the climate pro uh, solution or not? Uh, is there a role for carbon capture, either with natural gas for electricity or for industry? Um, whether you look at the select committee plan or uh, we look at where uh, everyone from Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez and, and Vice President Biden have moved. A, a lot of those uh, conflicts seem to be dissipating. Um, is that your sense as well? And, and how much of it is uh, a, a consensus or agreement around the urgency of action that will continue on after the election, particularly if Democrats win, versus uh, a uh, fleeting moment of unity because of the opponent that we have. Here's the way I think, think of it. During the primary process in particular, it was a good time to debate how we were going to do these things, things like uh, face uh, climate change and address the issue. And if all goes well in the election, we maintain our House majority, we get a good Senate, uh, and we uh, retake the White House. I think we'll be returning to those debates over exactly how to proceed. But in between arguing over how in the primary and weighing how in government is this general election. And this isn't about how, it's about whether. It is literally about whether we're gonna face climate change or not. It's about whether climate change is real or not. Settling that question as a country is the order of the day. And I do think that that just submerges some of the other issues that are very real. You know, what role nuclear ought to play? Uh, it, for my dime, it's, it's gonna be an important part of the transition because uh, for all the real problems with nuclear, the problem with carbon is uh, right now bigger, but doesn't mean that, that we want to uh, rely on it more than we have to. Um, same thing with a lot of these other issues that we're going to be negotiating. You know, of course, there are challenges in implementation. That's what we should be hashing out uh, in government, but first we got to get there. Uh, and so I, I am encouraged to see that there's a little more unity. I think not just uh, because of what we're up against. Uh, it should be motivation enough, but you never want your central message just to be the other guy sucks. Uh, this is a time to really talk about the world we could live in. And, and then we'll, we'll get down to the business of, of exactly how to make sure we deliver it. And we'll make some mistakes along the way. And that's part of government. Yeah, it's, that, it's a very good segue to, uh, we only have a couple more minutes. So I have, I have two more questions. Uh, in terms of the world we live in, um, what is the case that, that you would make to voters, particularly younger voters, who are skeptical of Vice President Biden, who may not think that his climate agenda goes far enough, or because of his age or his experience in Washington, he's out of touch with the concerns and issues that they believe in. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, uh, again, to, uh, to remember that the role of the president is to set a direction. 
uh, to broadly say, are we moving in this direction or are we moving in that direction? When it comes to climate, it's literally, are we going to act on climate or are we going to refuse to act on climate? I would also point out that in the vice president, we have somebody who has uh, been uh, out front on these issues in ways that, uh, uh, you know, look, a, a, a radically progressive position in the 80s would look like a conservative position today. So we know that there are some, uh, you know, some, some evolution that we've all gone through as a country. Um, but we got to remember that at the end of the day, the vice president's concerned with setting a tone that brings this country together, that moves us into the future, and that actually cares about what our future generation is going to be. Uh, whereas the, the current president has literally said, I'm not worried about the future because I'm not going to be here. He's literally said that. Uh, so this is our opportunity to have leadership that will set the tone that will then make it possible for us to be arguing over just how far we can go. Uh, but that means we actually have to be moving in this direction instead of that direction. That's the question that's being settled in November. And we need young people to be at the forefront of helping settle that question. Uh, the, the need for mobilization, the need for registration, the need for turnout, the need for uh, us to, to make sure that nobody's on the sidelines has never been greater. Otherwise, all of this is academic. And uh, it, 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 we can't afford for this to just be a theoretical discussion about what other people should do. There's a very real live question about what we will do. And it's going more than, more than at any other moment in a four-year period. Uh, your instance of greatest power is the instant you walk into that ballot box, uh, box or fill in, fill in that, uh, uh, that ballot from, uh, from home as we hope every American gets the opportunity safely to do by mail and decide what the direction of this country is about to be. So we've time for one last question. And I think you, you touched on uh, very clearly to people, help others register to vote, make sure that they're registered themselves, that they vote, that they get out the vote, that they help others. As, I mean, the last four months alone have unfolded in a way that I don't think any of us could have predicted. Um, we won't hold you to uh, the answer to this next last question, but as we're looking ahead to the next four months, what are you watching? What are you looking for that either we should be careful to see if it unfolds or that, that leaves you a little more hopeful? Yeah, so in terms of what to be careful for, look, I think there's a huge tailwind in terms of the realities, and there's a huge headwind in terms of the mechanics of the elections themselves. So from an electoral standpoint, that's what I'm worried about. Issue-wise, you're right, we're only halfway into this year. <laughs> we're in the exact midway of the year. Think about what that means. That means the impeachment, the resolution of the Democratic nominating process, the pandemic, uh, the response to the killing of George Floyd, the China and Russia scan. All of that just happened in the first half of this year. I will lose this year. Iowa was this year. Yeah. I mean, four months ago, I was running. Um, and uh, we're just in a different world. And so we've been very bluntly reminded about how much can change in four months, which is how long we've got to go till the election. And by the way, these world-shaking historical events tend not to happen in ones and twos. So I would be ready for another major shock or two, uh, possibly to include a national security event. Uh, I mean, if I were a, uh, a hostile foreign power or a non-state actor, uh, frankly, this summer would be a good time to try to throw, throw the U.S. even further off balance. We should be ready for that. But what gives me hope is that the American people really are moving in the right direction, and we need uh, the elections to reflect that. And there are things we can do about it. Yes, register, mobilize, persuade, vote, donate. Um, let me give you one more that's not being talked about enough. Consider being a poll worker. This just for anyone my age or younger is, I don't think, I, I can't even think of, of anyone I know my age who's done this, maybe a couple, um, which is interesting if you think about it. It's a basic civic duty. It's almost like jury duty. And the reason I'm mentioning this is no matter how good we get a vote by mail, it's going to be very important to have safe in-person voting options, especially for communities of color uh, and others who are less likely, more likely to be disfranchised if mail is the only option. And if you look at Milwaukee and how they went from 175 polling places last time to about five, with terrible consequences for, uh, for public health and for, again, especially black and brown voters' opportunity to exercise their right. There's a lot of nefarious stuff out there. One of the main reasons driving this is just we didn't have poll workers. Yeah. Uh, there just aren't enough because typically poll workers are retirees. Uh, and you know, we're being reminded, again, in very blunt ways that in this country, the most consequential democracy of the last 2,000 years on earth, our elections, for better or worse, are run by, for the most part, by state authorities, county officials, 
and volunteers. Well, yeah, you actually get paid. It's like jury duty, not much. But my point is, uh, that's something that uh, if you're saying I'm worried about what's going to go down on election day, but I don't know how to help. I'm not a trained lawyer ready to join a sophisticated election protection hotline effort. What do I do? Consider being a poll worker. It could actually be the single best thing you could do uh, to make sure there are more polling places able to handle votes. Uh, so that's the big thing I'm watching. Oh, one other thing. We're probably not going to know the results of the election on the night off. And uh, having lived through Iowa, I, I can definitely relate to how frustrating that can be. But knowing that especially if he loses, this president will probably try to uh, challenge the legitimacy of the election. Let's get ready now for the fact that that probably will happen. And it does not necessarily mean anything bad happened. It may simply be how long it takes to count the votes if we succeed in getting a lot of vote by mail done. So that, that's, that's extremely helpful. And it's a good reminder. Uh, it's a nonpartisan, but patriotic and civic yep. opportunity volunteer as a poll worker, and uh, don't think of it as election day, think of it maybe as the kickoff of election results week. Uh, Very good. Be yep. patient. Well, that, that's a fantastic way to end. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon for a really important conversation. Uh, we hope you're able to join us again, maybe closer to the election, and we can chat back so. how everything's proceeding. So we really that's appreciate good. it. Um, Same here, thanks for the great work you're doing. Excellent, really appreciate it. And uh, just for the audience, thank you also for joining us. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the conversation. Uh, we will be continuing with a new series of web events uh, in, in late July with the conversation on African-American public opinion research on climate change, which will take place on July 21st, and a look at the impact of COVID-19 and the economic crisis on innovation and startups on July 23rd. For all of you, uh, check back on our website, look at our Twitter feed, and we will also be sending out more information on both of those via email shortly. So thank you again. I hope you enjoyed the series of conversations as much as I did. And we will see everyone again soon online and hopefully in person, not too distant future. Take care.